it happened for Anthony Lynn, the Chargers coach, on Monday. And the vibe coming out of L.A. for the past several weeks has been, we respect Anthony Lynn. We're not going to make any decisions. We're not going to do anything. We're not going to start talking to people behind his back. We're going to let him get through this season, and then we're going to make a decision. And they got four straight wins as a result of it. Maybe in hindsight, the four straight wins don't really help them if we consider the Philadelphia dynamic, which we'll be talking about in an hour. But still, they finish on a high note. They win four in a row, and then they promptly fire Anthony Lynn. It's not a surprise that they did it. The management of the games was in question. They have too much talent to have been three and nine. The low point was the 45 to nothing loss at home to the Patriots with five games left in the season. And... You know, it's a it's an attractive job. And this is a an ideal time. If you're ever gonna make a change early in a franchise quarterback's career, let's go ahead and do it now and let's put the the sign out in the front yard, making it clear that you've got a very, very, very attractive position for a head coach to choose to come to and work with Justin Herbert. So, you know, you and I, Chris, have been ambivalent about this because we like Anthony Lynn, yeah. but the Chargers decided it was time and now it's time and now they have an opportunity to get a, a really good head coach to to continue to help Justin Herbert improve. Yeah, I mean, that that's the exciting thing. Anthony Lynn, you know, there was some good things he did there, you know, but it, it, the last two years, play has, you know, gone in the wrong direction. Even though there was moments this year where you go, seems like they can play against anybody and, and kind of hang in there, you know, uh, for, the, for the most part, other than that New England game like we talked about. But... The, the biggest thing with Anthony Lynn, too, last year, you know, we saw some end-of-the-game disappointment, right? Phillip Rivers, I certainly was part to blame there. He, he went through a funk last year. This year, we just saw repetitive issues down the stretch of games. It was just one thing or another. It didn't matter whether it was special teams, the offense running the ball at the wrong time, you know, improper usage of time timeouts, all of those things, and you know, that's what came back to bite him. And it's never a good look, Mike, or something is off when you have a top 10 offense and a number 11 defense in football and you're really nowhere near the playoff conversation. That tells you something's being done wrong. But, like, to your point, I, I mean, I don't know. I know, like, everybody wants Trevor Lawrence. Isn't this the best job out there? I think this is the best job out there. You got a guy that we, we know is on the way to superstardom at quarterback. And there's other pieces there. I would think this is a job that's as in high demand as any that's that's available this year in the NFL. I would always take the quarterback who has shown he can do it over the one who right? hasn't. Right. Because with the one who hasn't, you still don't know until he does it. With Justin Herbert, you know what you're getting and you know what he can do. And you've got almost a full season of film to look at. The problem with the Chargers in recent years has been too many close games. And if right. you're going to be in that many close games, you had better be Bill Belichick and find a way when the game is on the line to bend it all in your favor. And Anthony Lynn couldn't do that enough. Remember, we've talked multiple times about Philip Rivers' comment after the 2018 season when they were 12 and 4. We could yes. have been 16 and 0 or 6 and 10. Well, that luck started going against them sharply in 2019 and 2020, and now Anthony Lynn is out. If you're going to be a sustained long-term coach, you can't just be skin-of-the-teeth victories. You have to be winning some games. Not all of them, but you have to be winning some games convincingly. It can't come down to the wire. It can't be a, a, a key decision here or there made in the moment, especially if you're not going to be making on a consistent basis good decision. The right decision, that right. The That's issues. the big thing. Right. You're right. They got in those close games and did everything you said, and then it came down to key moments, and usually they found a way to mess it up. And you're right. That's like a double whammy there for a head coach. And, you know, sorry to see him go. I really am uh, because I do like him, like you said. But, yeah, that's going to be I, – I think that's I think that's the job, to your point. It's, you know, we know Trevor Lawrence, yes, all, all awesome, yes. You know, Deshaun Watson with the Houston Texans, amazing. That's certainly up there. But – you think Joey Bosa, Derwin James, you know, you know some of the, the tight end play, Hunter Henry, and of course him and Keenan Allen. There's pieces there already to play with to think you could turn that team around in a hurry and be in a major player with with a big time, big time quarterback.
Now, whoever gets that job, I think one of the first things he needs to do when he walks through the door is commission some sort of an internal study on strength and conditioning, training, flexibility. What are they doing right or wrong? Because they get too many guys injured. They do. That's been an issue with the Chargers. And until you really get into the nuts and bolts of it and look at what you're doing and why you're doing, you know, we see guys every week get twisted up into knots and they bounce up and they're fine. These are are professional athletes, highly conditioned, very flexible, and they escape injury more often than not. But with Chargers, it's been not. And there's too many key players who aren't available. You mentioned Derwin James. He didn't play at all this year. One of the best safeties in yeah, football. They didn't right. have the benefit of him at all. And you constantly have to worry about Joey Bosa. What can they do better? And to the extent that your coach becomes kind of the CEO, and that's really the question of what they're looking for. What do they want? Is this a guy who's going to be subservient to Tom Telesco? Are they looking for someone who can take over the organization? Do they want someone who's been around, who's got experience as a head coach for almost a decade, like a Jason Garrett? A lot yeah. of people were surprised last night when his name surfaced because the book on him is close the book and throw it away, frankly, as a head coach. But what do you think they should be looking for by way of type of coach to get the most out of not just Justin Herbert, but the rest of the organization. Yeah, sure. I mean, well, like Mike, first off, I mean, you're right. They got to figure out what they want. I think like if they wanted to go that CEO route, you know, management type route, that's probably where Jason Garrett comes in to talk there. Right. That's, that's, uh, that's where I would think that name comes about. You know, he's been a guy that, you know, I know it didn't like blow us away in Dallas, but Hey, Dallas didn't look that great this year without him. They were kind of a mess. Maybe he was a little better than we should give him, you know, give him credit for. But like the guy to me, Mike, without a doubt, I, you got Justin Herbert. You got already a top ten quarterback in football. You got a guy that I think is one of the five best arms and throwers and passers in football. You go full Andy Reid, Patrick Mahomes on this. You go offensive head coach and get in an arms race with the rest of football and say, we don't care if we're in the same division with the Chiefs. And that's where I go Brian Dayball. I love Eric Bieniemy. He deserves a job. I'm just not a big fan of let's take a guy from a team within our division and try to copy what they do. I don't, know, show, I don't really know that formula ever working. To me, bring in a guy like Dayball, who just worked with a young quarterback in Josh Allen, and we see the results, and then – I mean, you just you go after it and you you try to get you sign big time receivers and everything like that. You try to become the biggest show in L.A. because you got a quarterback that can make you the biggest show in L.A. Yeah, and I think you're right. They need somebody who's going to come in with that energy and that vision and who is an offensive guy. Something that dawned on me yesterday, and I've thought of this in the past, but it really crystallized as we were hearing rumors that Gary Kubiak, the Vikings offensive coordinator, is contemplating and planning to retire. Right. The Vikings have had a revolving door at offensive coordinator the past several years. I, I, and I know Coach Dungey would disagree with me on this. I'd never hire a defensive coach, not in this climate, because if you hire a defensive coach and your team is successful, you're losing your offensive coordinator. If you hire an offensive coach and your team is successful, maybe you keep your defensive coordinator. Dennis Allen's name never comes up. Right. And he's been a great defensive coordinator for the Saints. Right. But you think of the Saints as an offensive team and Sean Payton's in charge. And Dennis Allen is just kind of like, what do I have to do to get considered? But but if you That's get a, a defensive point, guy and you, and you get a coordinator who works wonders yeah. with Justin Herbert, see you later, offensive coordinator. Now you got to find another one. Uh, I mean, it's it's, it's you're right. It's it's uh, certainly something you got to think about. You know, when you make that type of hire, you got to think two or three years down the road a little bit to what could happen, what could happen to the staff, all of those things. And you know, to your point, here we are. Like, I mean, again. Wink Martindale is one of the big, best defensive minds in football. We don't really hear anything about him. Robert Sala, again, had a great year, and I know he's getting some interest, but it doesn't seem like the buzz is just, like, you know, out of control to where, you, you, you mean, offensive is the way to go right now. It does seem that way. It seems to be the in, in vogue thing, but especially when you have a guy like Justin Herbert. I think that's that's where you just got to go, all right, we have something special here, and – we can we can win games strictly on his right arm, and he has the type of talent to carry the team. And if we put a system and a few players around him, 
They could be one of the more fun teams to watch in football, which will bring the fans in. But, of course, we see, you you know, you can win that way and, and be very dangerous. I'm going to give back Casey credit for putting this one in my ear because I wouldn't have thought of it, but this is a good point. The, the offensive coaches tend to create the vibe of head coach in training. Defensive coordinators, not across the board. Sure. I'm thinking of Coach Dungy again because he was not this way at all, which may be one of the reasons why he was an attractive head coaching candidate. Defensive coordinators are a little over the top, a little rough and tumble, sure. a little Rex Ryan-ish. Right. You know, you've got Robert Saleh as the cheerleader on the sidelines. You, you've got you've got you know that that whole Ryan vibe that's floating around. You've got guys who, you know, Wick Martindale with the the, the Kenny Powers mullet. I, you, you you've got a different kind of a character. Sure. That some owners may not be comfortable saying, "Here are the keys." Please try to drive it safely. I, I, I think that's, again, a very fair assessment. They're not, not not necessarily always the guys that are the most buttoned up, like CEO, you know, stand in front of the, the podium and, and the emblem of the team behind you. Like, yeah, okay, maybe they might not win that aspect of being a head coach as compared to others. But, but I, I think at the end of the day, you know, it is about your coaching ability. And I do think that owners need to get over that a little bit. Uh, I, mean, I mean, I know we want young offensive guys and all that, and we're talking about Brian Dayball and the Chargers. Okay, it makes sense there. But uh, I still think, like, in the big grand scheme of things, owners right now are dropping the ball on some of those type of guys. Wink Martindale, Sala, Dan Campbell, you know, down with the New Orleans Saints. Guys that, yeah, okay, they don't look like, you know, Johnny CEO, but they can coach a team – and I don't know what I mean. Tell me about Mike Vrabel. How's that working out in Tennessee? Oh, pretty good. Curmudgeon, you know, doesn't have that, you know, CEO look. Uh, so, so uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but he's Go already ahead. lost Matt Lafleur, and he could lose. Sure, Arthur but Smith. your point that, about that is very problem. real. You're right. That yeah. point is very real. No doubt about it. Yeah. Uh, and and back to Jason Garrett. And look, I, I, it, it, you're right. Cowboys fans actually missed him this year. That's how bad it was. For the Cowboys early in the season in pretty much every Cowboys game at some point Jason Garrett's name would be trending because Cowboys fans were pining for Jason Garrett but there were flaws there early in his time with the team there was the issue of can he call plays while he's also managing the game as a coach right and he couldn't so eventually they took that away and then there was the notorious icing of his own kicker if you remember that I think it was in a game against the Cardinals and that just kind of settled in it was he was a guy who was on the way up and reached a plateau and never really moved from there. Sure. And I, I, I don't think, all due respect, I don't think that's what the Chargers need. It could work. I'm not saying it, it won't. But when you had Tony Romo and you had all the spending power that Jerry Jones brings to the table and you had the glitz and the glamour of America's team – and he did a great job coexisting with some really strong personalities. That's right. I just don't. I just don't think that is the formula right now with the charge. You don't have a lot of strong personalities running that team. You need somebody who's going to come in and kickstart a team that has been second class citizen to the Rams ever since they both ended up back in L.A. And I think you you need somebody who's more dynamic. You need somebody as dynamic as Sean McVay, if not more dynamic than Sean McVay, to really close that gap because. I think the Chargers have the better roster right now than the Rams, uh, but they clearly don't have the better coach. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm, I'm with you. It, it, it's right there. You're right. It's, it's not far off. I mean, if the Rams out do have a better roster, it's by very little. Um, you know, I, I understand, like, the optics around Jason Garrett. Uh, I look at him as a little bit more, you know, in a little bit more of a positive way, I think, than most people. And listen, I know I'm biased, too. Yeah, I know him. I, I played with him in Tampa Bay. I'm um, sure. But I think it goes back a little bit to like what you said earlier. It's what are you looking for? And he can be that CEO type of guy. You just mentioned all the things he had to deal with in Dallas, how well he did managing that situation. You know, you talked about the Chargers and, you know, the injuries and the issues like that. That's what that kind of head coach does. He gets everybody in the organization on the same page. What's the deal? Why are we getting so hurt so much? What are we going to do to fix this? How are we going to change it? Blah, blah, blah. I don't just coach football. I'm going to get into all aspects. I think that's where 
the beauty of Jason Garrett is, let alone, hey, took over Tony Romo at a fairly young age, did what he did with Dak Prescott. I'm sure that's the appeal there. But I, I hear what you're saying. It's not sexy. It's not going to get the L.A. Chargers fan base going, oh, my gosh, here we go. This is going like, you know, everything we dreamed of. No, it's not. It's It would be a different approach altogether. And, yeah, I'm with you. I kind of want the let's go for the high-flying offensive guy and go for it, and that's where I like Brian Dayball. We need to move on to the Jaguars, but one thing I want to say for now, and we may have to find some space to develop this because I think it's going to take some time to really break it. I think it's going to take some time to really break it down because I think he'd be perfect for this Chargers job, sure. frankly. To, if, to the extent that the Chargers need a top-to-bottom reevaluation of everything they're doing, now it may take several years to get to where they need to be, but Justin Herbert is the guy around whom you build for the next 10 years, so it would make sense. And if I were Josh McDaniels, I'd be very interested. I just don't know that teams are going to be interested in McDaniels after what happened with the Colts a few years well, ago. All uh, right. Uh, well, don't forget, you too, last year, he, you know, there was a lot of play, and we heard you and I heard a lot of rumors about him with the New York Giants, right? the Carolina Panthers thing that happened there a little bit. There was certainly names circulating, but yeah, last year wasn't a great offensive year with Brady there, the Patriots. And then of course this year wasn't, you know, great either. We know that. So it's a, what have you done for me lately type of thing? And yeah, he might be stuck in a spot here now where he might have to wait for a new quarterback or whatever that is and wait for the offense to explode again before he ever becomes the hot name. Hi, I'm Mike Tirico, and thanks for watching. Make sure to hit subscribe for the latest news and highlights from NBC Sports.